Hey guys, what's up? It's Pastor Corey. I'm the youth and worship pastor here at Cornerstone Church in Conroe, Texas. We are so happy. However you got this link to this video, whether you were referred to by a friend or you just strolled across, I'm so excited that you're watching. We believe that God's going to speak to you today. A couple things that you need to know. Make sure you get plugged into a Cornerstone table. This is where our primary means of ministry is going to be. Uh, we, of course, believe in the four walls of the church, but we also believe that biblical ministry is also done around a table in a home. So make sure you get plugged in, um, share what God is doing in your life. Uh, and, and I believe that as we do that, we will grow in our spiritual walk with the Lord as well. Also, we're starting something new called Encounter Night. It's going to be where the first Wednesday of every month, every ministry is going to join in the main sanctuary for a time of prayer and worship and a devotion. We're also going to feed you before. So if you like free food, make sure you show up as well. God bless you. Enjoy the message. And I hope you have a good week. Well, as I said earlier, if you have your Bibles, take them out, open them up uh, to Genesis chapter 3. We've been teaching through this whole month in this one chapter of the Bible. We've entitled this uh, The Roots of Redemption. Uh, in some of the messages, I'll just give you the highlights. You can always go back to the church website, uh, cornerstoneconroe.org. You can find any of the old sermons there. The first message in this teaching was uh, related to the false promises uh, of the enemy and realizing that when the enemy, when we allow the enemy to speak into our lives, uh, we're simply allowing the enemy to speak falsehood, to speak uh, lies to us. Uh, and then we jumped into the teaching on that particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, maybe ask the question, why, why that one tree? Why, why just that one tree, that tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil? And we identified what, what symbolically that might be in our lives. Uh, but with that, we realize that God gives us a choice. And we understand there really is no freedom unless we have a choice. And, and so that, that was the object of choice. Just the one negative thing, the rest was good and glorious that they could choose from. Uh, but just like us, they succumbed and made that choice and uh, suffered the consequences in regards to that. And then the third message, we answered the question, why Eve? Now, I know we never ask why Eve. We usually ask why me. Lord, why, why, why am I going through this? Lord, why, why, why do I have these struggles? Why, why do I have these difficulties of life? And, and there's a lot of different reasons. One, one thing that we did identify within that message is may, maybe, maybe we're just not giving off good signals of faith not communicating faith and making it easier for the enemy to come into work within our lives. That was just one thought that we considered within that message. Today, this last in this series, I've entitled God's Bad Reputation. God's Bad Reputation. And this simply stems, kind of a summary of all of this, back to the lies of the enemy within our lives. So let me begin by asking a couple questions this morning. Anybody ever been lied about in your life? Anybody ever had rumors swirl around about you? by chance. Most of us, well, if you haven't, I would just identify you probably haven't lived long enough. It's that interesting phenomenon that probably will happen uh, to all of us. But the reality is when people lie about you, when people share rumors about you, you develop a bad reputation in context to somebody else. And that's simply what the enemy loves to do in regards to God. I, I want us, we could probably quote this because you guys are smart, but for the fourth week in a row, let's read this. Genesis chapter 3. Pick up with me in the verse, first verse. It reads, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day, 
he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied, verse 3. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Verse 7, at that moment... Their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt their shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Father, we once again just say thank you for your word. God, I just pray this morning that our our hearts are receptive. God, that our spirit is responsive. Lord, to that which I believe that you've appointed for us. God, I just pray that we, we respond well. Lord, to to your calling, your direction, and that we make that choice to trust in you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. God's bad reputation. I have three thoughts for you this morning that I'd love for us just to process through and understanding God's appointment for us. But the first thing that I want you to capture that you've heard me say many times throughout this series is that the devil lies about God over and over and over again. The devil just simply lies about God. We, we capture this all the way at the beginning, right here in this, this, this creation story in the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve, we see, we see the serpent, we see Satan who lies to Eve. And we recognize in the initial point of this dialogue, the, the serpent's initial attack is directed at Eve. But I want you to see this. The real target here was God himself. The real target of the enemy is always God, his ultimate game is simply to try to destroy God, to take God down. And many times, you and I, if I could say this, we get caught in the crosshairs. As a representation of God, one who has surrendered my life to God, the enemy in attacking us is simply striving to attack God. The ammunition was simply words, catch this, words, attributed to God. The serpent contended that God had forbidden this couple to eat from eat fruit from any of the trees within the garden. And we realize in his first statement he's already lying. Cuz that's not what God said. Right? God just put before them you can eat of any tree except this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We realize that Eve knew the words of God. She knew that God had commanded that they not eat from only one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thus, armed with the knowledge of the word of God, Eve corrected the serpents. She could speak from confidence, born out of a certain knowledge, Gain from knowing 
absorbing God's truth into her lives. It's as if Eve was getting a foretaste of what Jesus Christ would experience years later when he encountered this exact same tempter in the desert. We find it there in Matthew chapter 4. Three times Satan tempted Jesus to sin, but each time Jesus repelled the attacks of the enemy with what? With God's word, time and time and time again, Jesus makes this statement, it is written. And what was the tempter attacking attacking Jesus with? God's word. Just a false form of God's word, just like he did to Eve. And Eve correctly responds with God's word that has been passed down to her. She didn't have God's written word, but she did have that word that God spoke to Adam, and evidently Adam passed down to his wife, Eve. Jesus faces the exact same attacks. And each time Jesus responds, it is written. It is written. It is written. Can I, can I remind you that Satan is very persistent. He, he's not going to give up with just one rebuff. He's probably not going to give up with just two rebuffs. Probably as long as we live, we're going to efface the temptations, the attacks, the works of the enemy the attempts of the works of the enemy within our lives. And in this initial attack, we would identify that it was a factual attack, a factual charge. Doubtlessly, Eve helped with the word of God, was able to charge against what it was that the enemy was Satan. When Satan contended that God said that she could not eat from the various trees in the garden, Eve knew better. She could judge the truthfulness of the serpent's statements immediately. But once again, the serpent doesn't stop there. He continues the attack. And in the second attack, he makes God out to be the, e- to be the enemy of Eve. We realize he's not going to be denied his goal of doing what? Breaking fellowship between God and humans. So here, here he changed his attack, and in this moment, we're going to read it, he brands God as the enemy of Eve. Look back, verse 4. He said, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We need only to look beneath the words to their meaning, I would suggest, to grasp the violent nature of Satan's attack in this particular moment. It's here that Satan isn't just attacking what God says. He's actually beginning to attack the very nature of God, specifically the the representation of the goodness of God. Although unspoken, the suggestion is still present. We'll we'll catch this. Why? Why? Why do we catch it? Because we face the exact same attacks in our lives. The suggestion that we might would say that the serpent is making to Eve is this. The only way to care for oneself is to rebel against God. Take this a little bit further. The only way to establish oneself is at the expense of another, most often specifically God. If God is really my enemy, if God is really using me, Eve must have reason, my only course of action is to rebel against God. You see, I've realized through life, it's difficult to refute an attack on one's nature. Eve, we recognize, 
could handle the factual statement, the factual charge against did God say this or did God not say this. But the moment that the serpent began to attack the divine nature of God, when the serpent began to attack the reputation of God, it was there that Eve began to slip. Let let me describe it to you this way. There's a big difference between saying John hit Joe and saying John is greedy and Joe is lazy. Right? I can go back and watch video. Or if I'm there, I see it. I, I can see the marks on Joe's face, the evidences that John actually hit Joe. But to attack the nature, that, that, that's a lot harder to defend. That, that, that's a lot harder to, to try to come about within our lives. And, and that's specifically what, what Satan, what the serpent is doing right here with Eve. We recognize, number one, once again, that, that the devil is always lying about God. We see the devil lying to Eve, and I want you to realize that, that we hear the same charges today. We, we hear the same lies today. Sometimes we see it in our families. They involve so-and-so said this or so-and-so did that. These are factual charges. With enough time, these charges can be approved or disapproved. But how does one correct a charge against the very nature of an individual within our family? It's much harder, much more challenging. We see it even in businesses Frequently, employees and employers scream at each other across the bargaining table. We might would say the picketing lines. What, what are they screaming? All you care about is yourself. What's going on? Each brands the other as the enemy. And I think one of the greatest ways we see the enemy working is in misunderstandings. Anybody ever been misunderstood before? Anybody ever misunderstood somebody else before? Yeah. It's often been said that what you see depends upon where you stand. What you see depends upon where you stand. Let let me describe this to you. What one marriage partner sees as an expression of love the other may see as being used. What the child sees as lording authority, the parent may see as appropriate discipline. Are you catching this? It all depends on where you're at. Where you're standing makes the difference based off what you see. What the employer sees as acceptable working conditions The employee sees as a lack of concern by management. Neither perspective may be entirely correct, or we might would say entirely incorrect, but the different perspectives cause unnecessary tensions. Misunderstandings are a great tool the enemy uses to sow discord, to sow disunity between us and maybe God. Maybe we misunderstood God's word. Maybe we misunderstood a spouse. Maybe we misunderstood a parent. And the enemy loves to come in and to do what? To start telling lies. And before long, catch this, because we've probably all been guilty of it, we think that that person right there is my enemy. We think that lady right there is my enemy. Right? For our enemy is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the rulers of darkness, but through the lies of the enemy, all of this gets skewed. And that's what's happening to Eve. She's beginning to accept and to receive the lies of the enemy. Specifically here, in regards to the nature of God, the bad reputation of God. My second thought I want you to capture this morning is sin. 
is joy that lasts for a moment, and then it passes. But we tend to believe it's going to last forever. Maybe it's a season, but I like to say just a moment. Let's look into this when we look back to this story. It's always interesting how sin approaches in the most attractive way possible. Like an animal is lured out of safety of its den by the tempting bait, so sin attempts to lure the believer into its snare. As Eve looked at the tree, the fruit appealed to her at the most basic level of life. It appealed to her survival needs by by doing what? By offering her food. What could be more basic than doing those things that that help us to survive in life? But the appeal was really more than food. The fruit appealed to to Eve on the aesthetic level. It was attractive, we might say. It appealed to the eye. Yet the fruit I would submit to you was still more. It offered the opportunity for what psychologists call self-actualizing. Eve could be fulfilled personally because eating the fruits she began to believe would make her just like God. On all the levels of need identified by psychologists, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was that which the enemy used to to lure Eve towards sin, that constant pull, bringing her closer and bringing her closer. The Bible, once again, points to the joy of sin for a season. We find this, Hebrews, that great, that great chapter of faith, Hebrews 11, verse 25, specifically here in regards to Moses, it makes this statement, he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Most of us can attest to the allure of sin. It can be as practical overeating when the mind runs wild, imagining how delicious a particular dessert will taste. Momentarily, our minds are captured by the the passionate moment certain perfumes or aftershaves are designed to produce. We see this, people sing beer commercial jingles and desire the experiences that are promised by the melodies. The lure of sin continues, although it may look different, From one person to the next. I mean, let me describe this to you for just a moment. I got three examples. Everybody knows what this is. A Reese's peanut butter cup. You know, if I was to open this, you realize that inside of this thing is a really sweet and smooth peanut butter. And the peanut butter is wrapped around it with some really good tasting chocolate. You know, when I look out, I mean, your eyes have already changed. Some of your mouths are watering. Why? Because this is a lure. Some of you are wondering, is he going to give that out? And look, there's already hands. I haven't even offered it. And there's already hands going up. Because we imagine how good this thing would actually be. Anybody want? I, I got it. I'm not, I, don't, I don't need it. It's Miss Ruth, everybody duck if you're not Miss Ruth. There. <laughs> Only God is good. I just get lucky sometimes. I got another one for you. How about a Milky Way? Hmm. I mean, it's amazing how quickly this works. I haven't even described. You already know by the experience of what's inside of here, Miss June, right? There's caramel. There's nugget of some sort, and it's wrapped in that good milk chocolate. Is, is this what you need this morning? Okay. Here you go, Miss, Miss June. That one went a little bit far. And I've got one more. This one is even better. Uh, because it has less calories. A three musketeers. Before I, before I 
present this to somebody. This, this used to be my favorite when I was growing up. I know that's hard to imagine. I used to eat these things real slow and just nibble the chocolate off the outside of it to everything that was less with that, that inside little nugget stuff. You know what I'm talking about? And I would just lick that thing, suck that thing, and slowly bite it just little by little because I loved it. And I bought into, this one's good for me. Why? Because it's less calories. Anybody want a three musketeers this morning? My friend right there, Mr. Silas. You know, I just hold them up. And all of a sudden, hands go up. Smiles go on people's faces. That lure. I mean, how easy was that? Right? Let's go back to the garden. We know she's already gone down the path that we say, just don't go down the path. She's there. And I'd imagine she's just circling the tree throughout this conversation with the enemy. She's getting closer. But each time she walks around the tree, and you know what? Nothing happens. So what does she do? I would submit to you, maybe with jerky motion, she reaches because she's right next to the tree. She reaches out and just kind of brushes up next to the tree. In fright, she draws back because of the Promise consequences. But again, she reaches out and she doesn't just brush the tree. She actually touches the tree. And all of a sudden, she realizes as she touches that particular leaf, nothing happens. I believe it's in this moment that her doubts about God are really beginning to grow within her mind. Why? Because from what she knows, what she's already quoted, she believes that not only if she only eats, but if she touches the tree, that she would die. But I'm still alive. So what does she do? She reaches out and she actually grabs a hold of the fruit. And pulls the forbidden fruit off of the tree. And nothing happens. At this moment, she has to be looking, questioning is God really true or is the serpent true? Just like you a moment ago. I think her mouth is starting to water. And she takes the fruit and just rubs it against her lips. And nothing happens. She can't take it anymore. And she bites into the fruit. Chews it up. Swallows it. Probably her heart beating out of her chest, she realizes nothing happens. With boldness now, she turns to her husband that's standing right next to her because she's convinced God must be the liar and the enemy must be true. Because everything that I've known about God is actually not happening in this moment. I, I, I've already testified that if I, if I not only ate it, but if I touched of the tree, that I would surely die. Now, now those questions about the nature, those questions about the goodness of God are really beginning to resonate within Eve's mind. She hands it to her husband. 
he bites it. I want you to realize I believe that Eve in this moment found the serpent to be more trustworthy than God. Not because of its credentials, but because the serpent said what she wanted to hear. What does the Bible say people will do in the last days? They will surround themselves with people who say what their itching ears want to hear. People that will feed their appetite, that fleshly appetite. But she hands it as I identify, believing that now God is the liar and the serpent is true. That the nature of God is is simply not good. That God was trying to keep something from me. That 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 now now I can eat of this and I and I can be just like God and and nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. She she's emboldened through this moment. She hands it to her husband who is right there with her. He immediately because he's watched all of this. He has seen this take place. He immediately bites into the forbidden fruit. And the Bible says their eyes were immediately open and they felt that shame. Why? Catch this. Because sin always has its payday. Sin always will have a consequence in our lives. One can overeat and enjoy every mouthful, but there is a price to pay. We realize that overeating is unhealthy. What One must exercise sufficiently to work off the extra calories because if one does it, one begins to... We've been there. We know. That's why I've gone back to the gym this week, hoping to keep going back to the gym. In light of the price of overeating, you know this, those extra bites are never as good as what we imagine them to be. It's like Thanksgiving that's soon to come up. We know we shouldn't do this, but we do it every year. And then we sit down and we ask, why? Why did I do this? Why did I eat so much? The search for passion often results in unfaithfulness and destroys relationships and wrecks lives. Adam and Eve ultimately found that God was right. They suffered the death of a relationship with each other, but bigger than that, a brokenness with God. They believed the devil's lies about God, and they paid the price. They paid the price. But I want to conclude here. How does God respond to his bad reputation? You know, I think we could say... It would have been right. I'm not sure that we could have even blamed God had he called his experience with man a mistake. I mean, it seems as though God has every right at this particular moment to to just wipe them out, right? He says, if you eat of this, you will surely eat. Die. Now, we recognize that that spiritual death, the byproduct of spiritual death, becomes physical death. And in this very moment, it would appear as though God has the right to, to literally to wipe them out. But I, I'm so thankful that God doesn't respond the way that we think God ought to respond. That God doesn't respond the way that the enemy lies to us about how God might respond. Rather, rather because God is love, he often doesn't respond in vigilance. God responds with mercy and grace. Despite 
Adam and Eve buying into the lies about him. God responds with mercy to their disobedience. How do we know? For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. Go back to the middle to end of Genesis chapter 3. We realize that God took the initiative to reach out to an undeserving man and promise that not only was reconciliation possible, but that reconciliation would actually occur. God even goes even, even further with this and even made new clothing for Adam and Eve out of animal skin. Then we skip ahead to Genesis chapter 12. Here God took the initiative and promised blessings to Abraham and his descendants and through them eventually to the whole world. Then we skip to the New Testament. John chapter 1, God, God offers Jesus Christ to do for us what none of us could do for ourselves. God reached out to undeserving humans and offers himself. I mean, we could almost hear the words of Jesus as he's hanging there on the cross with his arms outstretched, declaring, look, God is not your enemy. God loves you. God is, is for you. Jesus died so that why? That whoever might believe in him would not perish, but might have everlasting life. If you don't get anything else this morning, I'm going to make this statement one more time. Don't believe don't believe the devil's lie about God. Because he's going to lie about him over and over and over again. From the beginning, God has always reached out with mercy and grace and steadfast love. Joel makes this statement in the second verse. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do I deserve salvation? I deserve death. Why? Because I went down that path. I walked around that tree. I brushed up next to that tree. And let the enemy continue to entertain me. And I reached out and grabbed a hold of that forbidden fruit. Just like Eve, just like Adam, seemed so enticing. Everything seemed good. Everything was going good. The moment I bit into it, my thought is, oh my, oh my. And you know what I deserved? Death. But God says, I have another plan. another plan. That's why I sent my son. Because I didn't want you to experience that death. I want you to experience eternal life. I want you to experience everlasting life. So time and time again, God has demonstrated grace, mercy, in steadfast love into my life. And because God has done it in my life, I believe God does it in your life. But just like it was a choice to walk around the tree, to take the fruit and bite into it, it's now my choice 
to, ex- to receive and to accept his love, his pardon, his forgiveness that's made available for me. Here I can testify, I've made that choice. I've chosen Jesus. I wonder, have you chosen Jesus? Have you chosen that love? Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church? Hey, I just want to say thank you so much for making the choice of joining in with us uh, today. I just pray that this message was a benefit uh, into your life. Uh, And and I just want to take a moment and pray with you. Uh, But before I pray with you, I also uh, just want to provide you the opportunity uh, to know that your walk with the Lord is right. Uh, The Bible makes very clear to us that if we would believe in our our heart that God did raise Jesus from the dead and that we would confess that Jesus is the Lord of our life, uh, we would be saved. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus went to the cross is so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And if you've never made that choice, I I would just invite you uh, to make that choice today. And and I would love to pray with you and just pray that uh, the word today would be fulfilled in your life uh, and that we just grow together in our walk with Jesus Christ. So let's take a moment and pray together. Father, I just say thank you, Lord, for my friend, God, uh, their desire to know you, their desire to grow with you. Father, and I just, I trust that they're making that choice if they need to, to accept you as the savior of their life. God, and that uh, they're growing, God, maturing in their walk with you, Father. And I just, I pray that the word that was presented today, Lord, ministers to their heart, God, that that word is in an encouragement to them, God, and that we know that you are with us, that you are for us, God, and that you have great plans in store for each one of our lives. And I just trust that you would be honored, Lord, through our life of pursuit of wanting to know you, trusting that your will would be done. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. May you have a blessed week this week.